Welcome. Um, my name is Karen Kiefer, and I'm the Associate Director at the Church in the 21st Century Center here at Boston College. And on behalf of the Center and Boston College, we welcome you um, as, as you welcome Mr. Dr. Paul Farmer. Mr. Doctor. Mr. Doctor. <laughs> that works for, he probably has a lot of titles. Error. Um, Mr. Doctor. Anyway, tonight um, is really a celebration of friendship. And I say that because our theme for the semester is friendship. And when most of you came in, you noticed a magazine on your chair, The Gift of Friends. And it's our new magazine, hot off the press. Um, take a look at it, read it, share it. Um, and there's lots more um, that we can you know, extend to you or mail to you. Um, and you can also find it online on our website. Um, you know, it's interesting because I was thinking today that friendship is certainly at work at this event tonight because um, my colleague, uh, the director of the center, Tom Groom, um, fell sick yesterday, he was ill, and um, knew that he couldn't make the event tonight. And um, so we have a good friend in Father Ken Himes because all it took was to reach out and, and ask Father Ken to be here and to uh, pinch hit. And uh, he was like, absolutely. So I think that's a good friend and I think we need to give him a round of applause. Thank you, Ken. The poor thing having to I know, spend an evening with, with me. you. <laughs> um, also, we have found a friend in Paul Farmer. Anytime the center has reached out to Paul and invited him to come to Boston College, he's done his best to try to do so. Um, in the last 10 years that I've been at the center, I know that, um, Paul, you've been a part of our programs for at least three times, and then I know that there are other um, you know, partners here at Boston College that have asked Paul to come and talk, and he is so generous, and just we're really appreciative that he's sharing his wisdom and his grace with us tonight. Um, so just a couple of quick things. Um, Ken will interview or have a conversation with Paul for about 25 minutes. Um, then we're gonna open it up to you and we're gonna have a conversation. Um, there's a lot of people here and I expect a lot of people will continue to come in. So we'll have microphones, one microphone at the center aisle, another one over here at the far aisle. If you'd like to ask a question, I ask that you just get in line and, and, and be respectful. Um, and, um, and then once um, our time is over, which should probably be in exactly an hour, um, and I have to be really strict about that. Um, we're going to invite you to come into the lobby because there'll be books and, and Paul will um, greet you and, and say hello and you can, you can talk to him. So um, anyway, uh, that's the way it's going to go. Uh, it's time to roll because we're already a little bit late. So uh, without further ado, Father Ken Himes. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me out there? It's okay. So uh, you get deprived of uh, Tom Groom's Irish lilt uh, tonight, but you get the bonus of hearing English the way God wanted it to be spoken <laughs> with a Brooklyn accent. So uh, let me just, a few words of introduction uh, about our esteemed guest. And Paul's biography is one of those things that when mere mortals like me read it, First you come to admiration, and then you come to sort of deep envy uh, at his accomplishments. That's, a, that's a, one of the seven deadly sins, if, I, if I'm memory serves. I've all of them just about covered now, Paul. <laughs> the Paul Farmer is a medical anthropologist and physician. He's dedicated his life to improving health care for the world's poorest people. He is co-founder and chief strategist of Partners in Health an international nonprofit organization that since 1987 has provided direct healthcare services and undertaken research and advocacy activities on behalf of those who are sick and living in poverty. Dr. Farmer and his colleagues in the US and abroad have pioneered novel community-based treatment strategies that demonstrate the delivery of high quality healthcare in resource poor settings. Dr. Farmer holds an MD and PhD from Harvard University, where he is university professor and chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. 
He is also chief of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Boston. Additionally, Dr. Farmer serves as the United Nations Special Advisor to the Secretary General on Community-Based Medicine and Lessons from Haiti. Envious yet? <laughs> Dr. Farmer has written extensively on health, human rights, and the consequences of social inequality. He is the recipient of numerous honors, including an honorary degree from Boston College a number of years ago, but also including the Margaret Mead Award from the American Anthropological Association, the Outstanding International Physician Award from the American Medical Association, a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, otherwise known as the Genius Prize, in case you're not familiar with it. And with his partners and health colleagues, they were awarded the Conrad Hilton Humanitarian Prize. He is a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Join me in welcoming Paul Farmer. So Paul, uh, a little background question, perhaps, for people who may not be all that familiar with partners in health. So why not just tell us a little bit about what prompted you to initiate this, uh, this program, Partners in Health? What were you hoping to do? How did it sort of come about? Well, I mean, if I were to look for one answer, and you can push me back deeper, I'd just say Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I actually my best pal um, from undergrad, we went to Duke, um, who we just came from a Partners Health board meeting, and he's here, so I can't really lie about the origin story. <laughs> Todd, where are you? Best friends deserve a stand-up shout-out. Yeah, so, founder Tom, of Partners in Health, where are you? Come on, just like at least be sociable. So, <laughs> some, some white guy back there. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so I mean, I, uh, I, like a lot of people in this audience, um, but perhaps like fewer when I graduated from college and we were at Duke at the same time, you were there too. Um, I've heard his accent before <laughs> at church. Um, I never miss mass. Every day I'd get up and I'll vouch before I played foot, uh, basketball <laughs> or was it football? <clears throat> that was a joke. Could you guys like lighten up? Um, I took Duke to the ACC. I was a, no. Before Mike should just yeah. right? <laughs> um, So, uh, you know, I went to, uh, let, so that, that was the sentence I was, the complex sentence structure I was working on there. <laughs> like many of you in this room today, but perhaps un, like fewer of the people who were, in, or, you know, my classmates, mm -hmm. I got to go um, somewhere else, mm -hmm. uh, quite unlike, um, Durham, North Carolina, or Florida, where I'd grown up. Um, and unlike France, where I'd spent uh, maybe eight months during college, I went to Haiti. And I went to rural Haiti. And, it, you know, Graham Greene wrote a book called England Made Me. Haiti made me. And I, I, every time I come to BC, I try to say, underline my debt to Haiti to, to that year. I knew I wanted to go into medicine. I had no idea why. Haiti made me know why. I had no idea what kind of doctor I wanted to be because I'd never even been to a doctor. Uh, not really. Um, and Haiti made me know that as well. I, I, but, you know, and, and so the answer about Partners Health is, is Haiti. Um, and uh, I remember the first year, I think it was one of the, the first year I was there, I saw uh, something very terrible, a woman die in childbirth. Um, and. Uh, and spent some time trying to raise money for a blood bank. Um, of course, I was 23 or 24, and I was hitting up Todd. Let's just say he comes from a different social background than I do, so hitting up his parents was a good idea, lucrative. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought, just imagine if you had a group of people in the United States and in Haiti working together to address healthcare problems of people 
facing both poverty and disease, what would it look like? Mm. How would it be different from a missionary group? How would it be different from the, this is before the end of the dictatorship, so there weren't a lot of NGOs, but you know, we made a lot of mistakes, but anyway, that's how Partisan Health was born. Mm -hmm. And we always had big aspirations as young people do. Um, and we thought, we just don't want this, this is not a, only about Haiti, it's about the United States, poor people facing, pe people facing both poverty in the United States, uh, and disease in the United States. So we, we, we were thinking big enough to, you know, go big or go home or whatever back when we were, I was in medical school and yeah. Todd was in graduate school also up here. So it's partners in health. And given the fact that uh, the theme for this semester has been, in C21 has been friendship, uh, say a little bit about this kind of distinct vision that you're not just going into Haiti or other places and kind of dropping in, playing the role of uh, you know, the, uh, the medical whiz kids and then pulling out. You really do partner with people and really build relationships on the ground with folks. What role for friendship, what role for yeah. partnership in, your, in the strategy of PIH? Well, first of all, I mean, I, I, I just noted that Partners in Health was born out of friendships as well. Mm -hmm. So then the, the beginnings are really all about connections like that, not some business plan or strategic plan. Those are words I didn't know, and, and, and neither did my colleagues from Haiti. It was really always born out of friendship, and uh, and we weren't romantic in the sense of saying, well, it's all about friendship or all about love. Um, this, these were serious problems of, of structural violence, and I was just reading uh, about, about it already back in those days. Um, but we did not know we wanted it to look different from, uh, and, and I don't say, say this disparagingly, we wanted it to look different from standard aid and development work. Mm -hmm. Um, and also perhaps from some of the mission groups uh, that we'd seen. Uh, again, I'm reluctant to sound disparaging because there's some great people in those circles as well, both of them, including the mainstream development groups that you know, we sort of pilloried a lot, in, including in the founding documents of Partners in Health. We wanted it to be around solidarity, and we'd already discovered the term accompaniment and what it meant to uh, particularly to Latin American theologians. Um, remember, that was a time, mm -hmm. I just asked you if you'd left Duke, but when uh, Archbishop Romero was killed uh, in San Salvador, I've never even been, but that shook up my world. I was a sophomore, and it makes me look old, doesn't it? Sound old. Um, there was no internet. And let me tell you, it was a lot more civil and pleasant. <laughs> So we, we were not, uh, we, we understood that our, our bond, our, you know, this is now a group of an ever, a steadily growing group of people, um, that our bond was one of friendship or, you know, or, or professional. It was, you know, and the biggest challenge, threat to both accompaniment and friendship is really inequality, right? I mean, those, those are, I mean, that is a towering threat to mm -hmm. genuine friendship. There's a million Haitian proverbs about it as well. And, uh, and so, although it wasn't always easy to form friendships along, uh, across really deeply dizzying divides of, of uh, particularly of class, not of race, mm -hmm. not of language. Yeah, the language is easy. Mm -hmm. And if you don't speak a language, as I don't speak Russian or Kinyarwanda, and I have really genuine <laughs> friendships in those places. Um, it's really about this towering divide between a young American, for example, who goes to Duke and then Harvard and is going back between, back and forth later, very soon, between Harvard and Haiti, Harvard and Haiti, you know, a place where there's every imaginable uh, thing that you might need, and then no electricity, mm -hmm. no land, no food, no water. So it was, it was tough. Now, the other thing, this is, I hope, good news for all of you who, who believe that um, real friendships can be for, uh, formed across such divides as I, as I do, and, and now I know, is that you, you keep going back to the same place, those friendships will deepen and deepen. And I've been working with the same people for over 30 years sometimes. Some have died of old age. And uh, I still go back to the same village. So it, it, it happens organically just with time, but 
you know, not, you know, you have to listen to what people are saying to really engage in meaningful egalitarian friendships and understand that this is, you're not equal if one of you can zip off, you know, on a plane, you know, to, to Longwood Medical Area. Mm -hmm. That was a long-winded answer. But that was a fine answer. Fine answer. But my friend Todd just, just asked me on the way here, um, so how long is your monologue? <laughs> Familiarity breeds contempt, so forget about friendship. So I kind of was kidding before when I said reading uh, Paul's awards and his academic background is what made me envious. There's actually something else in his biography that really made me envious. Uh, and that is, I want to take Paul back to his youth. He was born here in Massachusetts, so that doesn't count for anything. But he was raised in Weeki Wacky, Florida. Now, Watchy. Watchy. Now, most of you probably have never heard of this, right? Florida, maybe you heard of, but not Weeki Wacky. It's a cultural capital. When I was a kid growing up in Brooklyn, and I mean like five or six years old, they used to run these TV commercials about if you ever come to Florida on vacation, be sure to visit Weeki Wacky. And Weeki Wacky was this kind of aquatic park, and they would show pictures of like people, you know, like six and seven people water skiing together and ducking under the tow lines of one another, and people like water skiing with other people on their shoulders. And then the highlight was they had this pool with a glass wall, and you sat below the water and they were the Weeki Wacky mermaids. And this was way before you could have bikinis, but you could have two-piece suits. And they would swim underwater, and you'd be washing them through this glass wall. And there were these hoses with oxygen hanging in the pool. And they'd be doing somersaults, and every now and over, grab a thing and take a hit of oxygen and still tumble salt around. So as a five-year-old, this was long before Disney World or Universal Tours or anything else in Florida, I thought, Man, oh man, besides spring training, this is the second best thing in Florida. <laughs> and he grew up there. So that's why I'm envious, really. He grows up in Weeki Wacky. But Paul... Shouldn't have taken those vows, Father. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, uh, they're still there. Weeki Wacky remains the spring of live mermaids. And uh, I went back to my hometown. And it's like 600 people a thousand people. 400 of whom are mermaids or ex-mermaids, right? Well, um, I know some of the mermaids. Um, the di now they're dissolute and retired mermaids. But anyway, um, I'm still friends with some of the mermaids. Anyway, uh, I was leaving, this is just a few year years ago, and, and I say, oh my god, there's the wiki Watchy sign still there. And I hope I don't offend your pastoral sensibilities. But the, the motto on the billboard, you look this up, it says, Weeki Wachi, working our tails off for you since 1947. <laughs> now that's the high end kind of place I grew up. <laughs> but that leads me, Paul, to ask none of us, of course, you know, comes at these things totally out of our own bootstraps by pulling yeah, ourselves for up. Sure. So there's a community that helps yeah. to form you it's family, it's yeah. friends, it's teachers, yeah. coaches, mentors, librarians, whatever, yeah. uh, scout leaders. Talk a little bit about. Who were the significant mentors or what were the significant moments you growing up that kind of put you on this path that where you wind up where you are now? What sort of kind of paved the way for you and put you along this way? This well, you know, I, I did, you know, at Duke, <clears throat> I, um, that's where I discovered medical anthropology. I'm still friends with my mentor, undergraduate mentor. Um, I, I, I'm still friends with my biochemistry uh, professor. Um, but to get to Duke from Weeki Wachi and the bus that I lived in, most families of eight live in a bus, right? Um, you know, I had, I had to have mentors there. And so this is, I'm only saying this not to be long-winded, which I am, but because you should all go back and thank your high school mentors. So there was a guidance counselor, and uh, her name was Wendy Taloni. And we were jerks, I got to say, in high school. I was, anyway. And she saw something in me. Um, she said, well, what, are we, you know, what do you want to do? And it was a Flor Florida public school. There was no public school in Weeki Wachi, needless to say. So we had to go to someplace called Brooksville, which is half an hour away, if you didn't have a flat tire. 
Anyway, and she said, well, you know, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be a doctor. Again, she didn't say why, because I had no idea why I said that. Probably because my brothers were these big, giant, athletic types, and I knew better than to toy with any sports. Uh, and uh, I said, I want to be a doctor. And she said, where do you want to go to school? And I said, I don't know, Florida State, University of Florida, University of South Florida, or the new school in Sarasota, Florida. Miami, too far off, too wild and metropolitan for me. And then she just said, well, what, what, have you thought about Duke? And I said, no, where's that? And uh, that, was, that was just one person, you know, whose job it was to be a guidance counselor. But this is not in some <clears throat> plush prep school where you have, you know, a staff. And, uh, and so that's, that's the only place I applied to, just because she said so. And I guess part of why, the reason I'm telling the story is to be grateful to your high school teachers. And the other is serendipity is... You, know, you just you don't plan out your life, um, and uh, and there's a lot of pressure on people at these elite schools like BC to to know exactly what they're going to do. And that went on and on. I mean, Haiti was Plan B for me. I've said that here before. I had I, I said, oh, I want to be a doctor who works in West Africa, francophone West Africa. Well, you know, there is no such thing as francophone West Africa, right? It's a colonial fiction, right? And I applied for a Fulbright, and I thought, oh, I'm so smart and handsome. <laughs> and a power forward on the Duke <laughs> NC AAA whatever, that I'll surely get the Fulbright. And I didn't even get an interview. And you know, I, 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 the first 10 years that when I, after I got into Harvard Medical School, I wouldn't have told people that story. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to be, hey, but I say it all the time now because you don't know how things are gonna work. You gotta be open. And then I kept on looking for places to work for free in Haiti. <clears throat> no one would have me. And I had no skills either, so they were right. And I found this, this group in Haiti, in central Haiti, a Haitian, a Haitian priest, actually. I still work with him. I still work with all those people, um, the same ones. And we built you know, the organization in Haiti and here. And, and I went to Rwanda and all these other places. Haitian, I went with Haitians. My colleagues went with us, Peru, et cetera. So, Again, my debt to Haiti is to Haiti itself, but also to the many of my colleagues from Haiti. So uh, you've been very successful, but no one's completely successful. You mentioned you know, a couple of setbacks early on. Oh, we had. But what about setbacks more recent? Has there been anything more recently with PIH that you really said, thought, of, thought to yourself, gee, I didn't see this coming? Yeah. And what did you learn from it? Well, I mean, I could choose any place in any year and go find setbacks. I've never had an experience, and actually another PIH board member, Leslie King, where is she? She's here, there she is. She and I are friends, speaking of friendships, the most of the, the people on the PIH board, which is still small, needs to grow, it's all a bunch of friends. So we became friends um, working with, you guys, some of you have read about um, Village Health Works in Burundi. And, uh, and, and she's on that board, too. And uh, why, did I, why did I get on Leslie? There was a reason. I had a train of thought. She wasn't a setback, I presume. No, so, uh, no. <laughs> she knows the setbacks. She you know, you can, you can, thinking of, again, I was thinking of Rwanda, mm -hmm. where we were lucky to have good conditions, um, uh, good leadership in the city, meaning not good conditions materially. It was a wreck. Right when we, but good leadership. But we had setbacks there, and lots of setbacks in Burundi. And the more, the more you're needed for work like this to make a preferential option for the poor, in healthcare delivery, the more setbacks you'll have because the more fragile mm -hmm. a place is. You know, Guatemala at the tail end of a civil war, Peru at the tail end of a civil war, Rwanda after a genocide and war. You know, you're getting the theme here. Mm -hmm. So we had lots, and Haiti was very disrupted and is, um, we had lots of setbacks. More recently, uh, let's just take the most recent thing that we've done as a collective, Partners in Health, um, which is to go to West Africa to, yes, to fight Ebola and take care of, particularly to take care of people with Ebola, um, but also um, to address something we felt we knew how to address, which w was, what do you do in a clinical desert where everything's been destroyed by war? Not ongoing war, okay? That is, other organizations 
to or do heroic work in the middle of war. You know, we have never chosen to do that or to be in a place. Sometimes war overtakes us, or mm -hmm. you know, conflict or terrible things like a her, I mean, a, an earthquake like the one in 2010. But we did say, you know, once active conflict is over, the reason they're having an Ebola epidemic is because of war, which wiped out the infrastructure that was already weakened by structural adjustment programs. Most people here might not know what that is, but you know, these neoliberal policies that say, you know, if you want to grow your economy, get, leave colonialism behind, uh, behind you, just grow your economy. You know, so these places, a lot of them had uh, some of the world's higher rates of GDP growth per capita because of diamonds, bauxite, iron ore, all the, the extractive trades, but they were clinical deserts. Uh, from colonialism on, including Liberia, and uh, and and war just raised that those that part of West Africa, Upper West Africa, as some would call it, and that's why they were wide open to Ebola. So we thought we know something about that. We had setback after setback, but one of the biggest ones, and one of the ones I would warn all of you against, <clears throat> not the, not the sort of rookie mistakes that we see a lot. Like we already know that you shouldn't look for cultural competence. You should look for cultural humility. Just know that you don't know, and then you'll make fewer mistakes. Not rocket science, right? We knew that all these clever ideas about how to make something sustainable and targeted and focused and you know, cost effective and you know, all this long, if we knew that was you know, hokum, right? That it required real, ongoing, long-term investment in building health systems, unromantic work. We knew that. The kind of mistakes we made, starting too slowly, mm -hmm. right? So we were there, I was there in Sierra Leone in June um, of 2014 um, with a bunch of surgeons, believe it or not, and surgical nurses. And I only knew four Sierra Leoneans in June 2014. I went from Rwanda, where we were living at the time. And uh, by no November, when we really got started rolling really seriously, rolling clinically, two of them were dead of Ebola. And they're both doctors. That, that's a mistake. That's a setback. You know? And unfortunately, I have to say, this, these kind of setbacks where your colleagues get sickened or die untimely, I've seen a lot of it. You know, I don't like reflecting on it all the time, but you, know, you lose friends also in this work. And if you're friendly with poor people, I mean genuinely friendly, uh, that, you know, th th those sorts of bad things happen to them far more than they would to uh, middle class uh, doctors, right? Mm -hmm. So th I regard those as setbacks, you know, and uh, I mean, think anybody would to lose colleagues and, and friends to something that could have been prevented or addressed more effectively med medically if once prevention fails. We're going to open up things to the, uh, for people, for you to ask questions of Paul in a second. So if you want to go to the microphones, you can do that. But one last question while we're doing that is you're formulating your questions. So Paul, you look out at this room. There's a couple of, uh, of gray-haired people here, uh, but not too many. This room is mostly a room of young people who are going to be leaders in the future. Uh, they're probably here, not only because of your athletic skills and yes, prowess, yes. but uh, they're here because they care about the sorts of issues you care about. Yeah. But as we've heard, it takes, it takes some sort of intestinal fortitude or some kind of stick to it yeah. to keep doing what you're doing for decades. Yeah. What advice would you give to young people here who want to be inspired and want to do the right things and want to make a difference in the world? What would you say to them at this point in their life? What should they be thinking about? What should they be practicing? What are the sorts of character traits they should start acquiring? What would you say to people who want to be, want to be you 25 years? Well, at first I'd say don't, don't want that. Just want to find your own path to, towards addressing the disparities that are so abundantly, you know, I mean, you, all you have to do is look in Boston, you know, in around here. It's not, so that's one, that's the first thing. The second point you just made, I mean, isn't it good news that to succeed in this work requires only that, you're, that you persevere? I mean, that's pretty good news, right? I, I, I know some people, I mean, 
another friend of ours from Duke is the smartest person in the world, literally, okay? Um, and so when you meet someone like that, it was, you know, you're thinking, oh, that's what a genius is like, right? MacArthur Genius Award. <laughs> I know better, okay? Um, but this guy is a genius, right? And uh, you don't have to have that. But if you can stick with something a long time, if it's something good and well thought, and if it's not good and well thought out, just course correct or fix it. So to me, that's, that's the main news. And then the third point is, well, looking at the young people here, uh, they're exactly the age I was when I started down this path. I was an undergraduate. And I told you already, I, I, I met a lot of these s problems, topics in a classroom, in, you know, in another cloistered place like BC, Duke, mm -hmm. right? And uh, those are three bits of good news. And the fourth one, you know, uh, the fourth bit of advice after saying don't, don't try to be like someone else, but find your own path, is friendship is critical to this. Um, and you know, that includes if you want to be a partner, you know, partners with people living in poverty, you have to figure out how to be friends across these divides. Um, but also friends who group together, a couple of my former students are here tonight, um, who I would regard as friends. You have to pull together. It's just never work about yourself, you know? If, if you can harness six bit of advice, I'll go for 17 in a minute. <laughs> um, if you can harness your own quest, for, you wouldn't be at BC if you didn't have a quest for personal efficacy, right? If you didn't, you wouldn't end up here if you weren't thinking, how can I shine? I mean, I've met people who in their 20s who talk about their legacy. Like, oof, you need to rein that in. <laughs> I don't say that out loud, though, you know, <laughs> because I, 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 I see myself in my 20s there, you know. You don't get into Harvard Medical School without having that, right? Completely inflated sense of your own contribution. Completely, right? So you also need friends to check you, right? And... Uh, but if you can harness that quest for personal efficacy into social justice work, which I know you can, you know, then you can drive for the agenda of what it means to be human in a very beautiful but troubled world. And that's one marked by deep inequality that, you know, that, that, that is shaking, you know, shakes everything up so much that that that's causes a lot of the instability I described. There, there's seven things you could do. I made that up, by the way. I don't even know if it was seven. I wasn't counting. Okay. Okay, so we have two microphones. Um, one I'll put right here, and then there's another one right over there. Um, so we'll just go back and forth. So who wants to start? You should be all very worried, because when I came in the door, I was kind of tired, but I'm not anymore. <laughs> I'm just getting warmed up. Thank you. So I, we're here with uh, Professor Dr. Oliveira, who's talked to us a lot in our class about subjectivity and how sometimes the recognition of needs in communities or people and the want to form those friendships or to provide aid or advocacy can sometimes lead to the subjectification of communities or people. So how do you think organizations, uh, individuals who want to provide that help, that friendship, can rein that in a little bit? Right? Yeah. And, and work against that subjectification and more toward the friendship that you talk about? Well, I mean, it seems to me, you didn't introduce yourself, by the way. Sorry. I'm Nick. Um, Nick. I'm a senior. So it seems to me that, you know, that is one way to do that, you know, to, to take a class like that, to do readings like that, to have discussions like that. What, well, you know, what, that's one of the points, right? That's why you're discussing this in a classroom. Um, and the more intentional and aware that we can be, like I just said, if you can rein in Instead of trying to stomp out your quest for personal efficacy, can you harness it to something? Um, and if, is that something is called social justice? And no matter what arena, if you're a teacher, if you're a physician, if you're a nurse, or if you're a librarian, I mean, just go through the list. You're a priest, right? Although you guys are supposed to do that. <laughs> um, if you can harness it to uh, the QP, quest for personal efficacy, um, I think you're more li likely to have honest discussions about not just subjectivity, but about how um, people can be objectified and essentialized, right? So 
you know, I see that you see this all the time. Um, you also see an anthropology which doesn't even necessarily concern itself with social justice or doing good works. Not, nece not necessarily, as I said. There are many anthropologists who are just as serious about this as, uh, as um, any of you might be or, or what we try to do. Essentializing means believing that because someone is, let's say, Haitian, they're going to think or be this way. I mean, that's where racism comes from that, right? Um, so I mean, I, I think that's part of it, is being aware. Um, and then uh, yeah, another, another risk, though, is to be so cautious, right, that you don't do anything because you're paralyzed by fear of you know, doing something wrong. That'll stall you, too, right? I don't know which is worse, an overweening quest for personal efficacy that needs to be reined in, or a, a revulsion with any kind of complexity that you think could, might tarnish you. Um, that is the privilege of privilege, right? People who think that way aren't facing themselves poverty. You know, I was hoping, although I'm sure I'll be uh, granted my prayer, I keep wanting someone to ask me if I have white savior complex. Because I'm thinking, well, I am white, or some people, my daughter included, say, he's, well, you're more pink than white. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, my, I mean, in medical school, they tell us to save people, like save as many sick people as you can. So white, savior, and I have a lot of complexes. So, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like that, those kind of, these are, these are discussions, by the way, that I hear almost exclusively in American universities, not in a rural squatter settlement in Haiti or a rural squatter settlement in Rwanda or a slum in, Peru, in Lima, you know, in Peru. It's here that I get this reliably, um, you know, these kind of questions, and they're good, good ones to ask. But um, I, do, I do think it's incumbent upon us to understand how, you know, some of these concerns, which, as I said, are real concerns to me, they're linked to our privilege and our ability to step back and reflect, right? Um, actually, there's another BC professor, uh, Gozueta, mm -hmm. but, um, who has written a lot about um, accompaniment, and it's, he's, it's um, the original book. I think was coming coming down with called Jesus. Right. Yeah, um, and uh, it's, it's really worth reading because it, I think, it plows through um, some of those concerns and, and just says, so how do we avoid objectification? How do we, you know, the other thing is, um, if you if you think, if you if you think. If you believe in identity politics uncritically, right, you know, you can go from saying, well, you know, my lived experience allows me to understand this problem better, which is it's good to know that and good to know when your lived experience does not, right? But what if you start saying, well, in order to treat leukemia, you need to have had it yourself. In order to treat breast cancer, you need to have had it yourself. That's just not true. Someone who has a lived experience, I mean, imagine in medical school if we started doing that, saying that, or nursing school, right? So I, I think there are, there are perils um, to, you know, uh, uncritical adoption of worry about identity as somehow disqualifying for the fight for social justice. Um, and also there are even more risks for us, probably, of not knowing when to be quiet or believing that we can be culturally competent when really the aspiration should be to be culturally humble. Is that, is that of course it's long-winded, but that's my trademark. Don't be bashful, more questions. Hi, Dr. Farmer. Hi. Uh, my name is Carly Anderson and I work in the Office of Campus Ministry. You've mentioned this uh, concept of cultural humility. I was wondering if you could talk to us about what it means to be a guest in a place or a culture. Um, first of all, I mean, I think it's another safeguard, back to, to your question, just to understand that you're the guest and you're host to the host, right? And, um, you know, that it's, a, it's a useful construct, and of course it's all over. Um, the world, the idea of host and guest. And sometimes there's the ugly side, newcomer, outsider. Um, but there are, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a, 
a richer tradition of understanding that you're supposed to be hospitable, that we're called to be hospitable. Um, but if we're called to be hospitable, I'm sounding all theological there, aren't I? You can take my lines. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, we're called to be hospitable. But if we're called to be hospitable, then somebody must be called to be guestbitable. You know? And uh, you know, when you're, you know, it's just, the reason I said it's a safeguard is uh, if you go to these disrupted places, um, and they include uh, Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union and all the other places I met, you're walking into a situation and context that structurally determines um, how you'll be received, even and, and you yourself could be essentialized or objectified, right? He's an American. Um, uh, you know, you go right, right through the list of what that could imply in Guatemala or in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. You know, in a, in a, in a position of, of real economic weakness, the supposed superpower, and this is what you see coming back with, you know, with sentiment, how do you say that? Um, shoot, I'm, I'm not showing off, I swear to God, I, I just forgot the word for with sentiment. Okay, I'll work on it. <laughs> um, and uh, is there any French speakers here? That, that, um, resentment, resentment, it's close enough, okay? You're walking into a situation of, of resentment. So understanding you're a guest, I think, is a, a smart thing to do. And then some places it's expected. Rwanda, you're expected to re be reminded. Um, I mean, you're expected to remember that you're a guest, whether you're the, a great medical professor or not, uh, whether you're a great development worker, whatever that is, or not. You, you're, you're expected to, to remember that. And, um, and then, of course, you know, that's just as a safeguard. There's all kinds of wonderful things that come to both guests and hosts when they understand um, solidarity and reciprocity. Um, and, uh, and yet, uh, one is the guest and one is the host. And th those roles can change over time. I don't know if one of my <clears throat> protégés is here. I invited him. He might be in the operating room uh, as a Haitian surgical intern. Right? He's up here. By the way, I get to host him by telling my research assistant, oh, Dr. Junior is coming. You will host him in your house. <laughs> can you order hosting? <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> but, um, you know, but I've been, you know, mm -hmm. I've been his guest, too, and, and he lost his home in the earthquake, you know. So I, I don't know. I think it's a rich and honest way of looking at things. It's like saying, OK, um, you know, yes, there are power disparities between physicians and patients, but it's also important to remember that you're well and she's sick, or and on, on and on through the, you know, just radical relat relativism is, uh, is really not, it would be, it's frowned upon in medicine. Again, that, and it's related, I think, to, you know, believing. If, we, if I started believing, look, in order to be a good, um, you know, good doctor who treats AIDS, you have to get AIDS. That's not sensible, you know. And, uh, but there are other roles, and guest is a, among the, the more rewarding ones, I think. I mean, I, I still think of myself, in a way, as a guest in the same village where I, have, I went in 1983. I don't think that's a bad thing. I imagine, Katie, part of what stimulated that is, I'm guessing there's a fair number of people in this room. It's spring break time, Paul, here. And a lot of people are going to Appalachia. A lot of people are going on a route bay trips uh, here. The oh, you don't go to days. Fort Lauderdale? <laughs> Some of them will go in the Wiki Waki after we've talked about it, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of people in this a room trips, who yeah. are going off to be guests in you know, environments they're not used to. Yes? Hi. Let me raise this. I'm a little taller than this. <laughs> My name is Alice. I'm a nurse practitioner student. I was actually in Haiti about six weeks ago with the nursing school. And unfortunately, when Trump made his disparaging comments, we were in the country. And it was the Haitians who had internet access and told us what he had said, which was fairly mortifying. Um, I'm just wondering, as much as I hate to bring politics into it, is our current leadership making it harder for you to do your work? Is that hampering it in any well, way? Well, I mean, I, I would say um, for sure. Um, and uh, let me give an example uh, that's quite mundane and, again, materialist, although nurse practitioners should also be materialists, right? <laughs> We're dealing with the body. 
Um, you know, it, it's uh, um, just going to some of the programs launched, not by the Obama administration, but by the Bush administration. A friend of mine, a former student of mine is here. I won't embarrass her, but her father was one of the architects of the world's largest program for the destitute sick in the world, which is PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Um, if those kind of programs, and now there's a lot of goofy foreign aid, as we say in scholarly terms, right? but not, it's not all goofy, right? A lot of it's really important, right? And some of it's used to political ends by the, the former colonial powers in the United States, but you know, to, to erode support for that will, will not be good. I, I will tell you what happened to me that day, the day of the shitholes. That sounds like a good book, The Day of the Shitholes. <laughs> Black Panther Strikes Again. Um, I, had a, I, I had a lot of my Haitian friends call me to say, we feel really bad for you, Paul. You know, that no one was, they, they said, that's sad for you to, to have to hear this. Um, and it was sad, actually. I was mortified, too. But that was the response. That's, that's friendship, right? That's your friends calling to say, don't let it get you down. I, I didn't have to say to them, don't let it get you down. He says stuff like that. Um, I just, I mean, I, and I just accepted it. I said, thank you, you know. Um, but I, I do, uh, it's not about politics, you know, only. It's really about, again, history, political economy, the re history of troubled relations between the two oldest republics in the Western Hemisphere, right? And that's an, important to remember. This is has been full of bumps. Um, and certainly the 19th century, right, when Haiti was the, the lone voice, the Black Panther, if you will, of the movement against slavery. All, you know, I haven't seen the movie yet, but I assume, <laughs> I assume if he's a superhero, Haiti is the superhero of that struggle, which began for them, well, the fight began in 1791. So imagine, in 1791, who are their only neighbors? Uh, who are a sovereign republic, not a colony, the United States. And until 1865, you know, we, you know, we were a slaving power, right? So it, it's, uh, it's not anything new for the Haitians. I think it shocked a lot of Americans because they're just not accustomed. We're not that accustomed to hearing that sort of thing publicly. I'm not talking about the swear word. I'm talking about, you know. There are such things, I think, as shitholes, right? But certainly not a whole nation or a continent, right? And, um, you know, but I, that was the response I got was, we feel bad for you. You're our friend. We, we care about you. Um, the, now, if we just say, oh, well, it's the X, Y, or Z administration, that's also a mistake, right? We've had bad foreign policies towards Haiti with good administrations and good foreign policies towards Haiti with bad administrations. It, they're our oldest neighbor, right? And uh, it's worth looking at that history. I, th I think it's also consoling to think about history. I don't know if others here believe that, but to know how deep these troubles are kind of allows you to take the long view on responding to the troubles and fighting back as well. And I hope the nursing school will continue um, it's wor if, it, if it's a formal, I met with some of the uh, nursing students, but I think that's a really worthy thing for BC to do is to think about their peers and future friends, the nurses in Haiti, um, and, and to do that work, and then the other clinicians too, but um, to do that work over the long term. You didn't ask me that, but I threw that in for free. <laughs> Karen, how are we doing time-wise? I'm just getting warned up. I warned you people. <laughs> you people. What do you mean by you people? Hi, Dr. Paul. Um, Hi. My name is Layla. I'm a senior. And um, you talked about working in places after a conflict has ended. Yeah. And I, I'm from Syria. I came from Syria three years ago um, here. And I've, as you know, like I'm hearing every day about like the yeah, healthcare system that's being like deteriorating. And things were already fragile before everything. And um, I guess my question is, 
Like for all of us, like I'm thinking of the people my generation, all of these Syrians who are now around the world, where a lot of us are studying medicine because that's what we do as Arabs. Um, <laughs> You're essentializing, Layla. <laughs> Um, I guess my question is, what advice do you have as in, like, we can't go in and do much yeah. right now, as in, like, what the next steps should be for us to prepare for that moment when we all go back and white savior and fix everything? Um, and then, like, what do you think is a realistic view of what we will see when we get back? Because you have been to places after conflicts have, have ended. Well, first of all, I don't want to sound, although I think you know, paternalism gets a, sometimes gets a bad rap, and maternalism does too. But I, 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 I'm relieved that you don't think you have to do that. You know, you're here. You've been here only three years. Um, great English, by the way. Um, you, you're thinking about medicine. Right? Did you say that? Um, you personally, right? Um, I'm glad to hear you say you don't. Your quest for personal efficacy and desire to help your beautiful and again troubled country, I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about waiting because you know, I'm ve I very much admire the people who can work in those conditions you know, in, in war zones. I'm not one of them. You know, um, and you can't really do a lot of um, good medicine in a war zone. You, know, you can provide trauma care if you have blood and you're not getting bombed. You know what I mean? Or if you're, I mean, even, a mass unit, you know, a medical army surgical hospital. Um, you can you can do just about any procedure, surgical procedure, or, but it's you know, there's there's not it's not like you have kids who aren't injured lining up for the well baby check, right? Or community health is out. So there's good reason to resign yourself to hard work and study. And I know it, I don't know from personal experience, well I do, that's not true. I mean, I know from personal experience how difficult it can be to turn away from that kind of suffering and to focus on something like your studies or in my case, seeing patients here or teaching here. But sometimes it is a perfectly um, a legitimate thing to do and a smart thing to do and a decent thing to do. And finding your way to be involved from afar is better, I think. And, and, you know, we also, you also can bet that the training capacity in Syria has been much diminished. So even training here as a physician or a nurse practitioner would be better than training there um, because we, we, we have pretty decent medical schools here. And, uh, you know, maybe well before then you'll find a way um, to go back. Now, now, now there's something that, that I would also say, again, this is, I'd have to know you better, but I've certainly seen this in some of my students, one of them sitting not two feet from you. The idea, I won't mention names or countries, but let's just say the Horn of Africa. <laughs> you know, once you're here, whether it's say, we're, you know, from California, let's just say as a hypothetical, uh, you know, you're a transnational bilateral. You don't have to use that goofy expression, right? But you're, you're you know, it, this may sound bad to you, but if you end up thinking of yourself as a Syrian-American, there are worse things to be, okay? Because you'll never not have been here during the war, right? And you'll never not have been here when you think about applying to med school. I hope you're here. This is where you belong right now. It's safer, a better place to study. So understanding that, as well is sometimes if you're here um, and train here and study here and train here, um, you can be a living link between a place that is pretty affluent and doesn't have war, at least not yet, and is trying to help rebuild. That may be a, a more powerful role for, for you. You don't have to call yourself Syrian American, but I'm just saying acknowledging that you're not in the thick of that. Of course, it's very dramatic when you're only here three years, but for someone who went to high school here or grew up here or went to call, you know, college or you know, like a certain unnamed future surgeon about two feet from you, um, you know, it's like, this is advice you can ask her. I mean him. I mean, <laughs> as advice I would give to anyone. It's not a, it's not a, a bad thing to do. That's advice that I would give to any, any student 
Are you an undergrad? Yeah. Certainly did. Any, any undergrad. And, uh, you know, I had, I, when I was in Haiti and got into Harvard Medical School, I, I would say things when I'd come back, oh, I really want to stay here, you know, and not go back to Harvard, which is a lie, by the way. This is not true. I did want to go back to Harvard Medical School. But it sounded good, and I was immature, right? But it's, I mean, I'm much more influential having stayed here, which of course I was going to do, and trained at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in medicine, and then I infectious disease, and now I'm a professor. So I can do a lot more for my colleagues um, from that post, my colleagues at Partners in Health, uh, my colleagues at in all of the sister organizations we work with, having stuck with that as well. We promised that we'd get you out on time. We're Me? Gonna do that. I didn't now, that. he has a long walk to get to the elevators, so you can tackle him at any point along the way and, and make him speak to you again. But for those who have to go, thank you for coming out. Safe thank home. you for having and me. And thanks to Paul Farmer. <laughs>